So hello everyone and welcome to the fourth of this year's webinars. Today on the role of proteomics in dementia research in collaboration with the UK Dementia Research Institute. We're joined today by two new speakers, Dr. Je Jeffrey Savas and Professor Seth Grant, alongside our guest chair for today, Dr. Blanca Diaz Castro. Our speakers will be giving us insights into their work on the role of proteomics in their respective fields of neurodegenerative research. And then Blanca will chair the qu chair question and answer session and roundtable discussion with our speakers. Before we begin, the London Proteomics Discussion Group would like to announce that we're looking for another committee member to help us out with organising and producing these webinars. So you don't need to be London based if you'd like to volunteer. Just drop the committee at lpdg at londonproteomics.co.uk and email to express your interest. So now I have the usual housekeeping points to go over before we hand over to our guest chair to introduce the speakers. So as always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussion, so please join us there to ask questions and use the thumbs up to let us know which questions you would like to hear answered. Because we have multiple speakers, it's best if you direct your questions to them by naming them as you type the questions, and then we'll be having the Q&A as a roundtable discussion at the end of both talks today. For those of you who need an attendance certificate for this webinar, there'll be details on how to get this after the last slide. And so once again, we'd like to say a big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, the Young Proteomics Investigators Club, and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for all their help and support in setting up this webinar. We'd also like to thank the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolomics Network, and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. We're also grateful to Imperial College London for providing us with the webinar support. Thanks also to our YouTube channel subscribers. All the talks today will be available again to watch later online. And we'd like to take this opportunity to advertise the BSPR meeting in July, a great lineup of speakers, so there's still time to register. Also, thanks again to our speakers and our guest chair for their time today. Now I'm gonna hand over to Blanca, who's gonna introduce our speakers and give us a brief intro into the work of the UK DRI. But first, I will give a quick introduction on Blanca. So, Dr. Blanca Diaz-Castro joined Edinburgh University in October 2019 as a UK DRI programme leader. She obtained her PhD degree at the University of Seville and after a brief stay at Northwestern University, completed her postdoctoral research at the University of California. Her research is centred on the study of molecular and cellular aspects of astrocyte biology that contribute to neuronal function in health and disease. She applies her expertise to understand how blood-brain barrier cells communicate and act as a bridge between the periphery and the brain. So I'll hand over now to Blanca to introduce the UK DRI and then the first of today's speakers. So Blanca, if you can unmute yourself and take control, it's over to you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that's, ah, I did request control, but I didn't go through, okay. Is it working now? Yes, ah, I could need to use the arrow, yeah. OK, here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I won't take too much of your time. I just want to welcome to the um, seminar series today that is in collaboration with the LPDG seminar series and the UK Dementia Research Institute. And today, as you may guess, we are going to focus on the role of proteomics in dementia research. Before I introduce our speakers. I just quickly mention what the UK Dementia Research Institute is, which, uh, okay, here we go, um, which is a multi center institute uh, localized at different institutions throughout the UK. And our goal is to focus on the um, understanding of the causes of dementia and trying to develop treatments to uh, uh, treat this very devastating disease. Each one of our centers is focused on a different aspect of dementia, as you can see listed here. And within the UK DRI, we also have uh, many collaborative um, approaches. For example, we have, is it changing or not? No. Ah, no. Oops. This has a bit of a lag, eh? So we have, is it not working very well? There. The UK DRI Tools and Technology Platform which is, uh, is, at the, um, is directed by Sam Jackson at the headquarters of the DRI. With this platform, we try to promote the use of 
specific technologies that might be useful for the research in dementia. For example, mass spectrometry based proteomics. And one of the things that we do is, for example, to promote this type of events. Also, collaborations between UKDRI researchers and uh, proteomics laboratories throughout the UK. So, uh, if you want to know more, you can go into the UKDRI website and contact us. Now, the reason why we are here, our two speakers. We are going to uh, look into how to use proteomics in dementia research and for this we will focus on the uh, synaptic proteomes in Alzheimer's disease and in aging. We have invited two leaders in the use of proteomics to better understand synaptic communication and its dysfunction in disease. The second of our speakers, I'm going to start with the second, is Seth Grant, which is a professor of molecular neuroscience at the Center of Clinical Brain Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. So he's my neighbor. And he's also affiliated with the Simons Initiative for the Developing Brain and a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. His research is focused on uh, the understanding of molecular diversity of synapses in the mouse and in the human brain with the hope of um, obtaining new insights into the mechanisms of memory and learning in healthy aging and in neurological disease. Our first speaker, which is going to go after me, is uh, Jeffrey Navas, which is an assistant professor at the Department of Neurology at North Northwestern University. Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. He, uh, uh, focus, he focuses on determining, determining how protein mishandling contributes to synaptic dysfunction, neurodegeneration and aging. And during many years, he has used uh, state-of-the-art labeling proteomics tools to better understand how the proteomes of synapses changes in Alzheimer's disease. So, with this, I'm going to hand it to Jeffrey and please go ahead. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers, Harry, Joanna, and Sam for the opportunity to tell you all about my research. This is a, a picture of Chicago facing south. You can all see how peaceful Chicago is and the absence of gun violence and all the trouble with gangs that you hear about um, in the news. The title of my talk, Pulse Chase Proteomics of the APP Knock-In Mouse Models of Alzheimer's Disease Reveals Synaptic Dysfunction Originates in Presynaptic Terminals. <clears throat> the amyloid precursor protein in eight beta fragments play a key role in early Alzheimer's disease. And this is shown by this famous plot here um, by Clifford Jack. So A beta dysfunction occurs many, many months and years, even decades before changes in tau and changes in brain structure, um, which precedes memory impairment by many years as well. And if we could understand how mutant APP or APP fragments contributed to Alzheimer's disease, it would be a major advancement. Protein degradation dynamics are impaired in Alzheimer's disease, evidenced by the canonical pathological hallmarks of AD amyloid beta plex and neurofibrillary tangles. In, in, in my project, we set out to investigate the question um, by, by which what mechanism does protein mishandling and protein impaired protein degradation contribute to Alzheimer's disease? And we hypothesized that the identification of early and proximal substrates in the AD brain may lead to new therapeutic targets for the prevention and or treatment of Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> 
So to get at this question, my lab um, uses the amyloid precursor knock-in mouse models, which were recently developed by the Saido lab in Japan. And the APP knock-in mice express a humanized A beta under the endogenous APP promoter. Here we go. There's three lines the NL line, which has a humanized A beta and the Swedish mutation, um, which essentially is going to drive APP cleavage by beta secretase. The, the NL mice are in negative control. They have no phenotype and no increase in A beta 42 levels. The second model is the NLF model. So again, humanized A beta, the Swedish mutation on the N terminus, and then the Iberian mutation on the C terminus, which is going to drive the elevation of A beta 42 about 20 or 30 fold compared to the NL. The third model, the NLGF model, has the Swedish, the Iberian, in addition to an Arctic mutation right in the middle of the A beta sequence, which leads to um, increased amylogenicity and aggregation. So the NL mice have no phenotype. The NLF mice have a very slow and mild phenotype where they just start to show elevated levels of A beta around six months, and there's no behavioral impairments until 18 months or older. The NLGF mice have more aggressive pathology with elevated A beta levels at as early as two months, and some type of um, some reports suggesting that impaired behavior at six months. So the data which I'm going to tell you about today um, will describe these three lines at two different time points, at six months of age and at 12 months of age. So the way that we investigate impaired protein degradation dynamics is by using metabolic labeling with a stable isotope nitrogen 15. So we obtain spirulina algae, which are grown on heavy nitrogen 15 salt. The spirulina algae are lyophilized, mixed with vitamins and carbohydrates, a little bit of, of oil, pressed into mouse chow. And then we provide this nitrogen 15 mouse chow as the sole source of food for female NL, NLF, or NLGF mice. We, these female mice are, are labeled metabolically with the nitrogen 15 over six months, and it's very slowly that during this period, the nitrogen 15 is going to be incorporated into all the biological macromolecules. The mice are bred, the pups are born, they nurse for mom, exclusively getting the nitrogen 15 um, isotope through the, the milk. And then once the, the pups reach an age of one or two months, we then change the food. We, and we go back to the regular N14 food. And then what we do is we track the, the, the proteins and level of N15 in these proteins after a six month chase period. So this just shows an uh, MS1 spectra that we previously published. You can see um, the N15 at time zero in red, and then at six months, you can see the old N15 protein going down and the new N14 protein going up. And even after 12 months, you can still see representative um, intact peptide um, MS1 scans showing both the heavy and light versions of the proteins. So just to schematize how this exactly this works, the, the pups are essentially are born nearly fully N15 labeled. And then they're fed a little bit further with the nitrogen 15. Then we change the food. The heavy proteins go down. The light proteins grow up. And then as an additional control, we actually we look in the moms. So remember the moms, those those mice are essentially born N14. And then they are um, going to be fed the nitrogen 15 chow. And that's going to slowly increase over time. So in the moms, the old proteins can be monitored by tracking the, the level of the N14. Have to bear with me. There's a huge delay in the, the string. There it is. Okay. So the next thing we did is we dissected brain region homogenates, either the cortex and hippocampus being two brain regions known to have relevant pathology, or the cerebellum, which is a negative control brain region. We we essentially dissected those brain regions, processed the homogenates with standard shotgun proteomic workflows, and then analyze them with Nanoflow LC um, in combination with tribrid fusion or retrap mass spectrometry. And overall, between all the genotypes in the brain regions, we do not observe a bulk impairment in protein degradation. So it's not as simple as the proteasome is being clogged. So then to take this a step further, what we did is we actually made a ratio of 
the NLF versus NL or the NLGF versus NL. And we plotted these hockey stick curves here. And then what we did is we focused on the proteins which have at least a 33% impairment. And we performed very classic gene ontology enrichment analysis of across the data sets. This is all plotted here. You can see hippocampus in the first column. This is FDR versus fold enrichment, cortex in the middle, and cerebellum. Then you can see in brown, we have the axon presynapse turns, dendrite in, in yellow, synapse in purple. And what is what's immediately obvious to us was that the presynapse, this, the proteins associated with this term, are significantly enriched in all of the brain regions, um, the hippocampus and cortex across three different paradigms but not in the cerebellum. So suggesting that proteins associated with the presynaptic terminal have selectively impaired degradation dynamics. So to illustrate this, we made this cartoon. Um, and many of the proteins which we found um, with impaired degradation are associated with synaptic vesicle endocytosis. So shown here is BIN1 and PICOM. Um, this is interesting because these proteins are genetically linked to causing sporadic Alzheimer's disease. But we also focus on a number of proteins uh, involved with the synaptic vesicle cycle. So in presynaptic terminals, we have the synaptic vesicle. It's going to be filled with a neurotransmitter. The synaptic vesicle then um, is trafficked towards the, the presynaptic membrane, docks, releases the neurotransmitter, and then is re-endocytosed. And interestingly, a number of the proteins involved with this process, um, including synaptic vesicle endocytosis machinery and the canonical snare proteins, including SNAP25, the calcium sensor, synapta tagmin, um, and syntaxin were also found with impaired degradation dynamics. And those are the proteins I'm going to be telling you more about today. Okay, so this evidence shows frozen. Here we go. Okay, so I just told you that those proteins have impaired degradation dynamics, but this doesn't tell us anything about the relative steady state abundance of these proteins. So to investigate the potential changes in protein abundance, we performed another quantitative proteomic experiments where we use nitrogen 15 labeled whole brain from wild type mice. So here it's just an internal standard and we mix this N15 whole brain with NL, NLF or NLGF brains we mix the homogenates and then prepare a synaptosome preparation from the same tube. And this allows us to control for any variation in the processing of the, of the samples. And interestingly, at, at six months, what we found was that many of the proteins with impaired um, degradation dynamics actually have elevated levels early. So suggesting that the impairment um, in degradation is actually driving a steady state increase of these proteins. And then when we go to 12 months, what we found is many of these proteins have reduced levels, consistent with the fact that synaptic dysfunction um, is ensuing at these later time points. So we were motivated by these, these observations, um, but we wanted to rule out the possibility that these changes could be due to increased mRNA um, gene expression. So we performed a quantitative nanostring experiment, and we found that none of these genes have elevated levels at this time point consistent with the idea that this, this elevated level is due to impaired degradation. So next, to investigate the possibility that these proteins with elevated levels um, are misfolded or potentially being tagged for degradation by ubiquitin, we purified the ubiquitinated proteins with an affinity handled called tube and performed Western blots of our, our proteins of interest. And none of these proteins had elevated levels. This was interesting to us because this now suggested um, that it wasn't a simple um, loss of function um, observation. To begin to understand the spatial distribution of these proteins, we made sagittal sections of the hippocampus. And here you can see the NL brains on the top row and the NLF on the second row, synaptotagmin in green, A beta in red, and the vesicular transporter VGLUT1 in blue. And you can see the patterns of these proteins are, are totally normal in these brains. However, when we look in the, the NLGF brain, we're, we're loaded with A beta plaques, and you can see synaptotagmin1 shows a similar pattern. Um, 
But then interestingly, when we looked at inhibitory synaptic marker VGAT, you can see that VGAT on the bottom here does not co-localize with the Plex. So I'll just show you a little bit more on this. So we then zoomed in on some of these plaques, and you can see here SNAP91, alpha synuclein, COM, SNAP25, VAMP, and others show complex patterns of um, protein accumulation in the plaques. And it, we think that this suggests that multiple mechanisms are probably contributing to the misfolding. And we can also start to investigate the possibility here that at least in the NLGF, brains, some of the protein accumulation appears to be due to um, this co-aggregation with A-beta. However, the, the fact that we find no evidence of co-localization in plaques in the NLF brains um, strongly suggests that there's both a plaque-dependent and independent mechanism at play. So next, we wanted to go on and investigate the possibility that APP or A-beta interacts with these proteins. And there's precedent for this. There's a large body of literature suggesting that APP is present at presynaptic terminals. So this just shows an IP Western blot for APP. And then you can see SIT1, Syntaxin 1B, SNAP25, VAMP1 all um, co-purify with APP um, and actually in all three lines. This is just a quantification for that. We've gone on and done a number of experiments, including IP mass spec of, of APP, again, confirming interactions with SNAP25, Syntax, and FAMP, SIT. We've done some additional experiments purifying A-beta um, with antibodies. And again, we can find many of these proteins seem to co-purify. And we're currently performing um, direct binding assays with a biocore system. So then to, to move our study beyond a descriptive uh, characterization of these mouse models, we performed uh, a in vitro reconstituted snare fusion assay in collaboration with Ed Chapman in Madison, Wisconsin. And what this assay does, essentially, it's a recombinant set of proteins and vesicles. On the left side, we have um, SNAP to Brevin with a FRET donor receptor pair. And then on the other vesicle, we have SNAP25 with Syntaxin 1A. And the idea is that if the, the vesicles fuse, what happens is the FRET donor pair will, will separate and it will fluoresce. And we can do this in the combination of cations or SNAP to Tagman. And then in the presence or absence of A-beta or scrambled A-beta sequences. And then we're just going to ask in this very artificial stripped down system, what does A-beta do to the rate of fusion? And interesting, what we found was that the presence of A-beta 42, but not the scrambled, actually significantly slows the, the rate by which the vesicles fuse in both a spontaneous um, and calcium evoked manner. So suggesting that some of the observations we find in the brain may be due to the fact that A-beta is slowing down the, the rate of fusion. Seeing we found that many of these proteins have elevated levels, we then wanted to investigate what the synaptic vesicle pool looks like. And we collaborated with an electron tomography laboratory at CU Boulder and performed these um, tomograms and then 3D reconstructed models of the NL, NLF and NLGF. You can see here the synaptic vesicles in, in blue. Um, and what we found was that to our surprise that there was actually a significant increase in the abundance of synaptic vesicles. So essentially the synaptic vesicle pool was also enlarged in the NLF and NLGF brains compared to the NL controls. To take this one step further, we collaborated with an electrophysiologist and then focused again um, on the Schaefer collateral CA1 region, as we did in the EM, and tried to assess the, the synaptic properties of the NLGF brain. Um, these are acute sections at six months, NL or NLGF. And many of the, the canonical basic um, synaptic transmission measurements showed no perturbations. So input output curves here with a, a, a field um, stimulating in recording electrodes. We also found no difference um, in the paired pulse ratio. And a number of other parameters also were, were normal. But in, the one interesting observation we, we found was that when we repeatedly stimulate um, the collaterals um, over with a the long extended train to actually drive the release of the synaptic vesicles, what we found was that it took longer to, to deplete the, the synaptic vesicle pool in the NLGF mice consistent with the EM results I showed you that the readily releasable pool is actually enlarged. 
we also found a bit of um, enhancement in a presynaptic potentiation effect, but I won't describe that here. So this is fine and dandy and interesting and descriptive, but as we all know, rodents don't get Alzheimer's disease. So we wanted to move this observations one step closer to something relevant to human condition of Alzheimer's disease. And what we did is we actually focused um, on a, a drug that was that's recently shown some therapeutic potential in treating um, mild cognitive impairment called lavastatam. So lavastatam or Keppra is essentially it's a drug which is classically used to minimize um, seizures and is to treat anti-epileptics. But then about 15, 20 years ago, there was some evidence from Leonard Mookie's lab and Magdalena's lab at Hopkins showing that some Alzheimer's mouse models actually have seizures. So they both of those labs actually gave some of the, the drug to both patients with mild, mild cognitive impairment and the Alzheimer's mouse models. And what they found was that there was some potential benefit. So seeing that there was this essentially this, this connection between synaptic vesicles and this drug, um, the, the, the mechanism by which levastatam works um, is, is, is odd because most anti-epileptics actually target the GABA system, but levastatam actually binds to a synaptic vesicle protein called SV2A, but how that works is not known. So with our previous um, data in hand, we were interested to see what is the, the the possibility if if we treated the NL, NLF, or NLGF mice with our vasotam for, for 30 days, starting at six months, the same time frame, we wanted to see what might happen to the brain proteome. So we did this experiment with, with TMT, shown here, 16 plex with a with a float channel. And here I'm showing you NLGF versus NL. And encouragingly, we found the same phenomena that we found with the nitrogen 15 paradigm. Essentially, proteins associated with synaptic vesicles are significantly affected. So next, we actually compared the, the NLGF mice that received vehicle or levastatam. And what we found was that am among the most significantly um, altered proteins were this, this group of proteins called the AP2 ho hops complex. And this is actually the key protein complex that plays an essential role in the three stages of initiation, assembly, and fission of synaptic vesicle endocytosis. So this drug seems to be essentially restoring the abundance of the synaptic vesicle endocytosis machinery. And this, this is not without precedent, but what, what is totally novel um, was, was the following. So we found that the, the vasotam treated NLGF brains had fewer plaques, about twofold, and about a tenfold reduction in, in A beta levels. And there's some hints of this with the, some transgenic mice. But the most interesting finding of our study was that um, was the following. So here I'm showing you Western blots from NL mice treated with vehicle or vasotam with the APP Western blot. And you can see the two alpha and beta CTF fragments here. And you can see that the drug did not have any effect on the cleavage of APP. But surprising to us, when we when we did the same experiment with the the NLGF brains, you can see here that essentially this top band, which is beta CTF, this is the the base cleavage fragment, that amylogenic processing was restored when we, we treated the mice with the vasotam. So this suggests that one effect of the drug is to actually put APP back in this healthier processing pathway. And it may explain some of the previous results seen in mice and in patients with mild cognitive impairment. This was interesting to us because it kind of unifies both our previous findings with the pulse chase paradigm with this potential therapeutic, which is actually in clinical trials currently. Just wrap up here in a second. So some conclusions and questions. I showed you that synaptic vesicle associated proteins have impaired turnover and elevated levels just as A-beta is accumulating in the NLF and NLGF brains. Um, the synaptic vesicle proteins seem to aggregate and misfold as in a plaque dependent and independent manner. I showed you evidence that APP and A-beta co-purify with synaptic vesicle fusion proteins, they can block vesicle fusions. And I didn't show you the data, but we also have evidence showing that APP brains actually have reduced intact snare complexes. Um, the EM and physiology results showed that the synaptic vesicle pool is enlarged um, and that there's a presynaptic potentiation enhancement in the, the mutant mice.
I also showed you that the drug Keppra or Larvacertam can restore non-amylogenic processing of APP in the, the APP knock-in brains, and that's presumably by restoring the level of the synaptic vesicle endocytosis machinery. And we're currently trying to further investigate um, which APP fragments and or um, a beta peptides that are playing the essentially that are responsible for blocking the degradation. So it could be it could be a the, the mutant protein processing, it could be a beta 42, and that's something we want to figure out. We're also testing direct interaction between um, beta CTF and a beta with snares. And we actually are now looking at some um, preclinical human AD um, brains to see if we can find evidence for this in the human populations. And one of the, the driving questions for us um, in terms of the physiology is that there's, there's some evidence now that um, single synaptic vesicle release mechanisms um, are very common in the brain. However, there's multi, multi vesicular release um, paradigms where the multiple vesicles actually may dock at the same time. And this has critical effects on downstream neuronal excitability and circuit dysfunction. And we wonder maybe this early perturbation that we found actually plays some key role in actually switching the mode of synaptic transmission in the AD brain. And this may play some role in the eventual um, synaptic degeneration and or circuit dysfunction. And just to thank, ooh, thank all the folks in my lab um, who did the work. Oh, no. Here we go. So um, this is actually a, the first author of our paper is Tim Hark. He's actually my first PhD trainee in Nalini Rao, who's another graduate student in the lab, um, and Sam and Lath and Sebi and Ava and Arun um, and Natalia, Ed Chapman um, at University of Wisconsin, Michael Stowell for the EM in Boulder, Anis Contractor, our physiology collaborator, the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, the NIH, and all of you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think that there's going, we are going to have a technological shift. I don't know if the slides are going to go away or not, but thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, please, if anyone has questions for Jeff, he, you can put them on the Slack channel or on the chat. And now we are heading it over to Seth if everything is ready to work i'm not sure the control request has just gone through just waiting for it yes there we go just go back one slide uh, I'll... is it working it might be waiting for me oh uh, tom says and just end share okay Maybe request it again? I'll request again. It says here was not accepted. I'll try one more time. Sorry for the delay. We are trying to, to fix the lag between slides. Um, I think I've got control now, just bear with me. Ah, now, no? There we are. Okay. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Terrific. OK, I think that was a beautiful demonstration from Jeff of the power of proteomics to understand key aspects of Alzheimer's disease. And I do think it's fair to say that uh, proteomics has had a transformative impact on our understanding of brain disease and the synapse. Um, excitatory synapses are about 96 percent of the synapses in the nervous system. I'm just waiting for the slide to change and about 4% of synapses are inhibitory uh, synapses. There we go. 
Right. Um, yes, it is very slow. And it was in the early 1990s that it was thought that the postsynaptic proteome of, oops, of excitatory synapses was made of just a handful of proteins, and that alone was sufficient for its biological function. And it was about 20 years ago which we did, when we did some proteomics um, mass spectrometry of complexes isolated from the uh, excitatory synapses containing the NMDA receptor and other proteins that we were shocked to find, as were other people, that it was about 10 times as many proteins as we had expected. Then over the subsequent years, we had done a lot of proteomics on the postsynaptic terminal, as indeed have other labs. And we now know that there's somewhere in the order of a thousand or more proteins that can be found there. And the actual volume of these synaptic terminals is such that you can actually occupy somewhere in the order of hundreds of thousands of proteins. But the fact is, it's an extremely complex uh, proteome. Now, this has had a major impact on our understanding of uh, brain disease. Um, and it was a decade ago that we completed a characterization of the human uh, postsynaptic density of excitatory synapses and found 130 different brain diseases of genetic Mendelian origin that mapped onto that. And there have been many, many more diseases and disease uh, genes uh, found since. This is a very out of date slide now, but you can even look at these numbers from more than five years ago for the number of diseases that impact on this. Now, this is really striking because at the time, and uh, you could go into a textbook and you wouldn't find a single example of a genetic disorder that had anything to do with the excitatory synapses um, in the central nervous system. Uh, and yet now it's considered to be uh, important for more, this set of proteins here is more important for brain diseases than any other set of uh, proteins in the nervous system. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about the organization of those proteins. And one aspect is that they are highly complex in their signaling capacity. For example, if you activate a neurotransmitter receptor, you can trigger the activation of many different kinases, which then phosphorylate very large numbers of substrates on many different sites, giving the synapse this extraordinary sort of molecular computational capacity. But the physical organization of synapses has been a very important area of study because these proteins don't simply just float around inside the synapse. They're physically organized. And we've done a lot of work on the organization of the individual proteins into complexes and what's known as super complexes, which I won't go into uh, in any detail today. But there's somewhere in the order of more than 200 different synapse multi-protein complexes uh, in synapses, and very few of them have been studied. And from the studies of just a few exemplar examples, we know that there are families of complexes and super complexes, and there's particular genetic rules and mutations that govern their assembly and organization. But there is this molecular hierarchy. Now, I'd like to uh, move a little bit on to the sort of spatial organization. And this is just a very brief summary of some studies that we performed on different regions of the human brain of the postsynaptic proteome of excitatory synapses and in the mouse brain. And you get different organization of these and distributions uh, of these proteins. Each brain has its own signature. And if you want to go read more about this, uh, you can show how you can use this data in combination with GWAS data, for example, to identify where diseases have their impact and how that relates to aspects of brain imaging. And there's some very nice evidence that this synaptic distribution of these proteins is important for the signals that one gets um, in aspects of brain imaging. Now, um, the spatial organization is really a key question that we're focusing on the moment at the moment, because although in general people have thought that excitatory synapses are just excitatory synapses, I'm now going to just explain to you how the organization of these proteins and complexes is important for building up the complexity of actual brain circuits. And what I'm going to just summarize for you in this slide, I think it is really quite important uh, and opens up some sort of new conceptual aspects of thinking about the organization of the brain. I've already indicated for you that there is the assembly in this molecular hierarchy of proteins into complexes and super complexes. But as you'll see in just a moment, it is that these different molecular machines are differentially distributed into different synapse types. And indeed, there's a very large diversity, uh, unexpectedly high diversity of excitatory uh, synapses. And the term synaptome has been used now for several years to describe the diversity of synapse types. And it is now known that these different synapse types are distributed on the dendritic trees of individual neurons. There's difference between neurons, and then there's differential organization distribution of different synapse types across 
uh, the, across the brain to give it its regional and global uh, architecture. And there's a term that I think is also very important, which is synaptome architecture. And it refers to the spatial organization of the, of the synaptome, the differential distribution. These synapses are not just distributed randomly. And I'm going to show you just a few example slides from some recent studies where we've been mapping um, synapse molecular composition at single synapse resolution on a brain-wide scale, but with a very limited depth. We've only been tagging, in this case, two postsynaptic proteins, PSD95 and SAP102, with fluorescent markers by creating knock-in mice. And as I've already mentioned, these uh, encode uh, components of protein complexes, two physically distinct complexes. And so then you can visualize different synapses containing these complexes, either individually or in combination. And using spinning disk confocal microscopy, you can sample large areas of the brain and look at individual uh, synapses and quantify the expression and various other morphological uh, parameters. And using image analysis tools developed in our team by Ricky Kui, who's done an amazing job on this, we've been able to classify, detect and classify different types of synapses according to their density and the intensity, size and shape expression parameters. And then using machine learning on very large data sets, have been able to then just do a data-driven classification of excitatory synapses into molecular types and subtypes, and then classify and describe these and locate them across maps of the mouse brain uh, and across the lifespan. And one of the messages that comes from these data-driven approaches is that if you, um, with these data-driven approaches, you can see a really unprecedented amount of synapse diversity and I'm just describing how these two proteins, PSD95, can be differentially distributed into three types of synapses, where synapse is expressing only PSD95 or SAP102 or a combination. And they can be further classified into subtypes on the, by virtue of their um, morphological uh, properties. And what's striking about these different subtypes of synapses is that um, they have differential distribution. And I think you can see in these little maps of the hippocampus here, where each map represents a different subtype. This one here is in CA1, it's enriched CA2, dentate CA3, here's some with gradients and so on. And it is really very striking how these differential uh, subtypes are distributed. Here is another example of that using these coronal sections of the mouse brain. And the 37 subtypes are indicated in the, each in their individual color. And in each of these pixels, we're looking at the dominant, that is the most abundant of those subtypes. And it's quite evident that there is these beautiful differential patterns of these subtypes of synapses, giving its brain its the synaptome architecture. And this is a very interesting kind of plot here because what we're looking at for the first time is a map of synapse diversity. In other words, where, which parts of the brain have the greatest diversity and what is the diversity of any part of the brain? And you can see here in the hippocampus, for example, very high synapse diversity and in regions of the cortex as well. And these more sort of basal structures have much lower uh, synapse diversity. Um, as soon as the slide changes. I will. Yeah, OK, here we go. One more time. Yeah, so in these areas of the, oops, I was going to show you that in areas of the cortex, um, uh, there are these differential distributions of, I'm going to try to go back to it. There we go. Three areas of the cortex here. And I just want to point out for you, just look at these uh, pairs of columns, diversity is on the left, dominant subtype on the right. Just look at the dominant subtypes in this region of the somatosensory cortex versus this part of the visual cortex. And you can see there are these differential distributions. There is really this really remarkable architecture uh, across the brain. Um, we've also looked at this relationship to physiological properties and um, uh, structural connectome and functional connectome, and you can read about those in the paper um, if you wish. So some of the surprises that come from doing these single synapse approaches is that the synaptome is really very large and contains a high diversity of synapses. And with three proteins, you can detect 37 excitatory synapse subtypes with these beautiful differential distributions. If you had 10 proteins, in principle, you might be able to get as many as 10 to the 11 synapses, which happens to be the number of synapses in the mouse brain. And as you've already heard me mention, there is over a thousand different synapses, uh, proteins and synapses. So I expect that there's a vast diversity in the brain that we have yet to explore. And as I mentioned already, the synapse diversity is organized into an architecture, and you can see this at all these different scales. Now um, I'm going to talk just about uh, how we've applied these technology across the lifespan. 
And biology, the lifespan is in fact extremely interesting from the point of view of uh, mental functions. And there has been very well described for many years the cognitive trajectories um, of humans. Initially, they have very limited behaviors, but as they grow up, obviously acquisition of language and many other functions, which peak around about the age of 30, and then there's a decrement in general cognitive functions. There's differential decrements, I should point out, between different aspects um, of cognition. For example, what's known as fluid cognition, which is the ability to process new information and working memory and these kinds of functions. It generally decrements as you get older in humans, whereas uh, so-called crystalline cognition, as your acquired knowledge and core capacities of language, you know, something like wisdom, it uh, generally maintains itself. And it's always been perplexing as to why these might have these differential, age would have these differential effects. So what we did in this study was to take about 10 representative age points, and this was work done by a PhD student, Melissa Cizeron, in, in collaboration with the postdoc Ricky Quee in the lab. And they basically analyzed brain wide across all these different ages in the mice. And you can see, for example, here in this region of the hippocampus, that there is differential expression in different synapses, and you can look at subtleties in the different size and shape uh, parameters and the expression levels um, in, in, that, in those areas. So every, every protein has its own trajectory um, in its composition in every brain region. Uh, the numbers change in every brain region, diversity changes. It's really remarkable. The synaptome and synaptome architecture is continuously changing across the lifespan. There's no such thing as development. The brain is always changing with respect to its synapse molecular organization. Now, as far as the early phases of life up to uh, adulthood's concerned, I'm just going to show you something which I think is, again, really very, very important. And it is the expansion of synapse diversity. These are diversity plots of excitatory synapse at mice of different ages up till three months of age. And it's quite evident that there is low diversity very early on and it rapidly increases um, throughout this period of time, peaking at about three months of age uh, in the mouse. One of the other things that should be evident from this is that as different regions of the brain acquire their synaptome architecture as a result of the diversification of these synapses, the brain regions themselves actually diversify. And here's a way of looking at this. What we're doing here is comparing all of these different brain regions against each other and looking at their similarity and red being the highest level. And so at one week of age, there's a lot of similarity in the brain, but by three months of age, that similarity Hang on, here we go. There we go. So three months of age, there has been, you see a lot of these blue areas emerging. And so there is a loss of similarity. The areas of the brain are becoming dissimilar. They're becoming specialized. But here's a surprise. As you get older, 18 months of age, you can see more similarity is returning. So the change in the synaptome architecture of the brain is initially causing differentiation of brain regions, and they later on become more similar. Another way to look at that is using these so-called hypersimilarity matrices, where you're comparing all regions at all ages. And I just want you to look at these three big white boxes here initially. And these are areas of similarity that we see. And it's very nice that this one corresponds up until about the age of weaning in the mouse. And then there's this period of time, which is up to about six months of age. And then from six months to 18 months, there's an aging uh, change. So you sort of see these three epochs of sort of childhood, middle age and um, old age emerging out of the synaptome architecture. And here these yellow boxes show the increase in similarity that is occurring between some of the brain regions with very young mice with those of very old mice. So what we can see by looking at the synaptome architecture or the lifespan synaptome architecture, as we call it, is that you see this differentiation of brain regions and then de-differentiation. And you can divide the, uh, this synaptome organization into three different epochs that broadly correspond to those three uh, areas. And I find that very interesting because it is really being shown in these classical psychiatric, psychological studies of humans that there are these trajectories across the lifespan, which match very well with what I've just been describing for you. Now, I want to turn to aging now just for a little bit and ask ourselves what happens in the mice between three months of age and 18 months of age. And um, these plots here show you about 100 or so different brain regions of the mouse um, between those different ages. And these first plots up here are showing us the effect size 
of um, the synapse density, effectively number of synapses per unit area for PSD95 positive and SAP102 positive synapses. And you'll notice that the zero line is here and therefore this reduction is telling us that there is a loss of those synapses um, in all of those different brain areas. There are some interesting differences I might point out between these different molecular types of, of synapses here. But there's also something else that's intriguing down here, which is that there is an actual increase in the size of synapses as one ages. And that has been seen before in uh, macaques using electron microscopy studies by John Morrison, Patrick Hoff and others. But uh, we'd like to explore that more using our synapse subtype classification. And what I've shown you here are plots where we have, these are, these are heat maps, where on the x-axis, we're going from one week up to 18 months. And here's all the different brain regions. And so if you just look at each one of these rows as a trajectory of the changes for this subtype, which happens to be number two here, you'll notice that it becomes more abundant as you get older. And indeed, in all of these brain regions, it becomes more abundant as the mouse ages. And same here for this subtype number 34. But here's some subtypes, for example, that generally become less abundant as you get older. In other words, there's aging resilient subtypes and the reason they appear to be more abundant, by the way, is because the other synapses are being lost. These ones are just preferentially retained uh, and these ones um, are being preferentially lost. And that may have something to do with these cognitive changes that differentiate these functions uh, with age. We certainly don't know that, but that would be a very interesting um, issue to consider because it would suggest then that um, some of these synapses that are retained are important for some of this crystallized cognition, but some of these other synapses are more important for these sort of working memory-like functions. I'd now like to spend a little bit of time looking at diseases of the synaptome and just point out for you something that we found to be very interesting, which is that Firstly, I should tell you that because synapse proteins, different proteins are in different synapses, if you have a mutation in a particular protein, then ipso facto, it must only affect those particular synapses. And that is certainly true. But there's another phenomenon which we refer to called synaptome reprogramming. And what that means is that it's not just the synapses that express the proteins that are affected, but by making a mutation, you change the spatial distribution of other types of synapses. And what we have done here is to measure the, you're just using the PSD95 marker and quantifying in these brain, in, in the mouse brain, the density and intensity and size of, of um, individual synapses, density of the population, intensity and size of uh, synapses in different brain regions. In this mouse model, which is a DLG2 mutation, or PSD93, we can see that there is increases in density in many areas of the brain. By contrast, this SAP102 mutation, um, leads to reductions in many areas um, of the brain. And incidentally, this parallels very nicely a lot of the cognitive changes that have been documented um, in those mice. But I'd like to show you in the few remaining minutes some of our work on Alzheimer's disease, because I know that's of uh, great interest to this particular audience. And a PhD student, Dr. Olympia Curran, who's now a neuropathologist, um, has done all the laboratory work of this, and again with Dr. Ricky Quee, who's done the computational image analysis, in collaboration with Professor Colin Smith, who runs, who's a neuropathologist who runs the Brain Bank here in Edinburgh. And uh, as a sort of a prelude to doing some work on the, uh, uh, on the pathological brain, we started to try to apply our image analysis methods to that of the normal uh, human brain. And in this very small scale study, um, which is now being published. We looked at four normal subjects in 20 brain regions, only with PSD95, and just measured these parameters of these different synapses. And these little diagrams indicate for you that there are these differential distributions of synapses of different densities and different intensities and sizes in those area, very much like we saw in the mouse. And you can define these similarity areas and, and architecture there. And in fact, we did correlations between the areas of the brain that are conserved between mouse and human, and we find evidence of um, correlation in the synaptome architecture between the two species. But um, this is a, a picture of the hippocampus, and we went on, we've now done much more detailed analysis focusing on the hippocampus here, and this would be a typical sort of image that you might have of the human hippocampus delineated into various areas. And as you can see in these close-ups, there's very considerable differences in the synaptic puncta uh, morphology which is uh, what we have quantified and classified using our image analysis methods. And we've done this in a group of normal individuals, uh, 17 
um, 11 BRAC2 stage and 10 BRAC6, all about average age of about 60 years of age. And in these 22 hippocampal regions in every brain, quantifying about 90 million individual um, synapses in every one of these. And then for every one of those synapses, uh, measuring these various parameters and then using data driven approaches have classified those synapses using the same sorts of methods we used in the mouse. And you can define seven types of synapses by virtue of their various uh, parameters here. Now, um, these are just very simple uh, maps um, of uh, the hippocampus and just showing you for the, each of the seven subtypes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that you can see differential distributions of those subtypes. And again, just highlighting this fact that these subtypes of synapses, uh, they're not uniformly distributed. Each one of them has their own particular synaptome map um, of, the, of the brain. So what happens in Alzheimer's disease? Well, everybody knows that there's a loss of synapses in Alzheimer's disease. So we'll just show you what we found when we did this quantification on this very large scale here. And these are plots uh, that Olympia made. And in, on the x-axis, we're just looking at the pumped accounts as uh, per unit area. And green is the control. And quite obviously, the green peaks are over here on the right. In stage two, early Alzheimer's has shifted to the left, in other words, a loss of synapses. And as the disease progresses, there's a loss of more synapses. So that's very nice to see, and it's nothing new. But um, this is new, and this is interesting, and it's still under investigation. And this is a very complicated plot, and I'm going to show you in the next slides just to break it down and simplify it for you, so you needn't struggle over this one. What I'm showing you here is how the synapse subtypes are differentially affected at disease stages. And each one of these sets of um, figures here is for subtype one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And we're going to ask how each of those subtypes are changed, the abundance of them, the density of them, changes with the progression of the disorder. And the first thing we're going to look at is the difference between the controls and end stage Alzheimer's, stage six, so it's sort of overall impact of disease. And these are the different subregions um, of the hippocampus, each individually here, and I'm not going to spend much time on that. But I'd like to just draw your attention to the fact that I've drawn here in green, just to aid um, your visualization of this. Um, you can see there's very few asterisks in these boxes, whereas there's lots of asterisks in these other boxes. This subtype here, which is known as subtype three, um, is actually resilient to the progression of disorder. We don't lose those subtypes in Alzheimer's disease, but we do lose the other um, six subtypes with the disease. But we don't lose them all at the same time. And in this, uh, I'm, I'm breaking down those that are affected early in the disease, that is up to BRAC2, where there's mild cognitive changes. And we seem to be losing subtype five and subtype six selectively. And then when we go for the latter um, stage from two to six, we're then losing these other subtypes and, and, and at different rates. So this indicates to us that Alzheimer's disease, it's not just a case of losing synapses, you lose different subtypes of synapses at different stages of the disease. And obviously knowing more about those different subtypes will be important. So in conclusion, um, there is a very high excitatory synapse proteome complexity and there's also a very high synapse diversity. Now there's a hierarchical logic that organizes the proteins into complexes, which then generate synapse diversity in the synaptome architecture. And it's the interference with that logic in diseases that results in the different spatial and temporal features of the disturbances of the synapse architecture. And the excitatory synapse proteome complexity is impacted in over 130 human brain diseases of genetic origin. And diseases impact specific excitatory synapse types and subtypes. And as I've already mentioned, Alzheimer's disease progresses through stages affecting different excitatory synapse subtypes. Now, I've mentioned the people as we've gone along, but again, I want to highlight the uh, wonderful contribution of Ricky Quee to the image analysis work. And Melissa and Faye and Olympia are all PhD students who led the work on all of the synaptome mapping work that I've described for you today. Babas and Regini have done uh, the computational work in support of that of Ricky up here. And I haven't talked much about the work of uh, the other individuals here, but I do want to acknowledge Naburu Komiyama, who has been responsible for engineering the tag mice um, that we have used. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much. Everything is very interesting. I have many questions, but there are questions on the Slack channel. So let's start with that and then I'll ask after if there is time. 
Uh, Jeff, are you ready? I want to start with you. you are I'm ready. Me? Okay, good. So, will your 15N data set be something you could use to investigate on a global level which proteins are long lived? Do you see any particular protein, for example, myelin proteins, that will stand out as long lived? Uh, for example, uh, slow to increase in the thing and in the mothers and slow to increase in the pups? That's a good question. Um, so we originally published two papers during my postdoc where we used the same general N15 pulse chase paradigm. Um, one's a 2012 paper and one's a 2013 paper. In the 2013 paper, we report uh, a table of proteins which at least five percent of the protein persists for at least six months and a number of proteins associated with myelin are in that list and um, we've had a number of, of people interested in myelin have asked about this and one interesting thing that we've seen with myelin is that it's um, longevity actually differs based on brain region um, similar to some of the things that grant was um, Seth rather was reporting so that that's a good question and yeah we've looked at that and um, we've we've actually done a lot of studies on this in wild type brains and um, there's a number of other proteins that are interesting in terms of their persistence at, such as mitochondrial proteins which is something which we're working on now. Can I, I have a follow-up question so do you find that cytosolic proteins live for less time than transmembrane proteins for example? It's a good question. So um, this is something that we've many people have asked us about. So we use nitrogen 15, right? So this is elemental nitrogen, right? So this essentially we can only confidently identify fully nitrogen 15 versus fully nitrogen 14 proteins. And recently the Fornicera et al. in the Rizzoli lab actually used the SILAC paradigm. So using essentially a heavy version of an amino acid and for short term protein half-life measurements, the SILAC paradigm is better because you can actually model incorporation and then degradation and turnover. We really look at proteins that are very long-lived because under short chase periods of two, seven, or even 30 days, there's lots of chimeric proteins, which are very difficult yet, if not impossible to identify because we don't know where in the molecules the nitrogen atoms are located. Okay. Okay, I have one here for Seth. Uh, is the decrease in synapsis diversity with age related to lower protein expression of certain components of certain components or expression is still the same but some synapses just stop being formed? Um, synapse diversity itself doesn't change between three months and 18 months. It's actually fairly stable from that time on. What happens is that it's the compositional signature of the brain areas that causes the de-differentiation. So diversity increases up to three months and then remains stable. Um, and then what happens after that is that some of those subtypes are preferentially uh, lost. Um, now, to the extent that some, you know, the actual individual synapse dynamics uh, are known of those different subtypes, uh, we don't know uh, about that. So it might be that uh, uh, people who've done imaging studies have shown that uh, dendritic spines, some fairly significant fraction, tens of percents of those, uh, are uh, retracting and reforming in the cortex and in the hippocampus um, over a period of weeks. So I expect that those subtypes that we see will be divided into those that are physically turning over um, that is retracting and reforming and then there will be another subset which will be those that are very stable and I think that's relevant to what Jeff was just talking about namely that there are some proteins that are particularly stable and presumably those sorts of stable those long-lived proteins would exist in those subsets of synapses that would be themselves physically long-lived. Okay another question for Jeff Isotope changes can affect some reaction kinetics. Do you see differences between 15 and uncontrolled mice with no treatments? Oh yeah, we've, we've done those experiments. Um, the only thing that I, so we've done this in mice and rats and wild type um, animals and these knock-in mice. And 
One thing that I have seen is that um, on occasion, the litter size of the, the moms that have been labeled with the N15 um, can be smaller. And we, we've done parallel experiments where we have uh, unlabeled spirulina, so nitrogen-14 spirulina, um, and we also see some of that phenomena there, so we can't really nail it down to the isotope. Um, I know like deuterated drugs, this is a, a hot field, but we don't see anything overt um, in terms of a specific effect with the nitrogen-15 chow. Okay. So for Seth, for example, does areas with high synapse diversity mean more diverse functions? I mean, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, firstly, one of the really intriguing simple relationships that we see is those areas of the brain that are involved with higher cognitive functions have higher synapse diversity. Um, and that's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, we've collaborated with Professor Eric Franzen from Institute of Technology in, in Stockholm. And Eric has done computational modeling of how the synapses can be used for the storage and retrieval of information. And here's a really very, very interesting idea that I want to put forward to you that, that we've modeled and presented in these papers. Most of you will be familiar with the notion that something like synaptic strengthening or LTP is a way of storing information, a representation in a map of synapses. But I'd like to offer you something completely different to that from the basis of what I've just shown you here. And it is that if you have a map of synapses um, which are made of different molecular types and subtypes, then that in itself represents a storage of information. And the way you can then retrieve or read that information out is when you present a pattern of activity to it, whatever pattern you wish, a theta burst or something, then those synapses will respond differentially and thereby obviously drive the neurons differentially and produce an output. In other words, synapse diversity is a way of encoding information which can then be easily and readily retrieved in a spatially organized fashion. So um, this is a very, very interesting concept because it does not, by the way, it has no requirement for synaptic strength changing like LTP, because as Jeff was pointing out with some of these pathological synapses, in his case where they have different amounts of sort of facility with short-term plasticity paradigms, some of them might facilitate more, some of them might depress more. If you now just use short-term plasticity and synaptome maps, you can encode and retrieve information. So I think we're opening up all sorts of new sort of potential, you know, theoretical ideas and practical ways of thinking about how learning and memory and storage of information can work, which is really very different to the standard models. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another can I ask question? a question? Yes, of course. Seth, I'm curious what you think about the the power um, or comparison of using imaging versus using biochemical strategies to investigate these questions. I think the main issue here, Jeff, is simply the spatial resolution. Um, obviously, we'd love to have the depth of uh, mass spectrometry at a single synapse resolution, and no doubt that'll happen one day. Got you. I, I've always seen them as entirely complementary, obviously, the, you know, the chunks of tissue, the bulk tissue. And as I was listening to your talk, uh, Jeff, let me just reflect on one thing. Um, you show these very interesting changes in synaptic vesicle uh, release and so forth. And, you know, there's two ways to think about that. And I think you presented one of them, but let me offer you a different one, which is that um, if you now have a set of different synapses which are diverse, and you've preferentially lost a certain subset of synapses, and you are now left with some that have more synaptic vesicles or more release probability or something, it might be that those synapses in themselves haven't changed at all with the pathology. There's been no change. It's just that the other ones have been lost. And because you're using a bulk preparation, you can't distinguish between those possibilities. You really need a single synapse resolution way of doing that. Uh, we wrote a little paper recently which was um, it's called the synapse diversity dilemma. And it's the, the problem is that there's so many methods, including bulk biochemistry, but also synaptic physiology, just in slice preparations or extracellular recordings and whole cell recordings, where one's looking at the summed result of many, many synapses. And when you have high diversity, in fact, in the hippocampus, there is the highest synapse diversity, you just really don't know what you're measuring at the level of individual synapses. So I think we've got to think about these population effects as well as the sort of assumption that most synapses are all made of the same stuff. 
Oh, that's really insightful. I didn't show you the data, but Synapse density was unchanged at those time points in our mm -hmm. results. But your point is still very well taken. <laughs> yeah, no, and one thing I wanted to ask you too, Jeff, you did this uh, aging um, in your normal data, not in your yes. disease mouse models. Um, I was wondering how much different, uh, what differences you saw, if any, between, I think you said six and 12 months period. Oh, I, so we have a, a new project where we call it Pulse Step. So we actually pulse label for three months across aging. And right then on. we use TMT to look to see like what changes in an age dependent manner. And there's a lot of representation of synaptic protein changes similar to what you've seen. So yeah, there, it, it's not um, entirely linear in terms of aging. There's bursts and then things. But yeah, we're still working on that. But that's a great question. Yeah. OK, should I continue? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Jeff. Have you thought about your experiment and feasibility in other model organisms where neuro neurodegeneration is more commonly observed? For example, short-lived killifish? I know the ones. Um, yeah, we, we haven't done that, but that's a cool idea. Um, yeah, so the, the nitrogen-15 labeling is it's essentially very um, easy to incorporate to any model organism so you can label bacteria and feed the bacteria to worms. Um, people have done this with flies, with the, the food for flies. And yeah, the killifish, that would be very interesting. Um, but no, we have not done that yet. Okay. Seth, what the, what's the biggest driver of synaptic diversity? Transports, <laughs> transport stability, transcription, or translation? It's a big one. It's a good one. It's a tough one, especially <laughs> if you don't know the answer. Anyway. <laughs> you, can, well, you can speculate. You, you know, I, I don't know the answer, but I do want to make a comment about transcription and uh, cell types. Obviously, there's a huge amount of interest and drive in the world of transcriptomes of individual cells these days. Um, a, a PhD student uh, in my lab several years ago, Nathan Skeen, he now works for UK DRI at Imperial. He um, was doing transcriptome analysis in mice across the lifespan. At the same time, we we're actually looking at mice carrying gene mutations. And in this study, we did something a bit unusual, which was not to look at mice at three months and then six months and 12 months. We actually looked at a very large number of mice at lots of sort of randomized ages. It just happened to be we had a huge spread of mice. And from that, we could then do whole brain transcriptome analysis uh, in the hippocampus, in this case, whole ge genome-wide transcriptome in the hippocampus. And Nathan then plotted the trajectories of every individual gene um, as a function of time. And yes, people are interested in the levels of expression, but we were interested in something slightly different. We wanted to ask, when are the gene regulatory events that are occurring? And that could be simply determined when the, the trajectory switches direction and that inflection point. And you can quantify those and then you can use machine learning and you can plot out and identify algorithms that allow you to um, predict with great accuracy the age of a mouse just by looking at a single RNA sample. But when we looked at these data very carefully, what we observed was that synaptic proteins were undergoing a sort of coordinate regulation which peaked at around about the same time we see this peak in synapse diversity that we've observed in the synaptome work. So um, I, I don't. Uh, I, I think that there are major drivers of transcriptional programs that underpin uh, this work. And and I should point out another thing that after this peak of, of diversity or these regulatory changes in the transcriptome, after that there was very few of them uh, with age, which sort of corresponds very nicely with the sort of stability phase um, and the sort of general, you know, not too, not very major changes with age. Um, beyond that point of three months in the mouse. So I think uh, transcriptome regulatory mechanisms and the sort of chronological me me uh, me um, regulation of the transcriptome is important. And we describe this thing called the genetic lifespan calendar, which is this temporal changes in the transcriptome. And it's probably got something to do with all of these studies um, about methylation and chronological effects and things of that kind too. So I suspect those, those are really underpinning this molecular hierarchy that then controls the differential expression of the proteins, the complexes, and thereby the synaptome architecture. Okay, I I think I'm going to ask a question for Jeff, a bit the combination between Jeff and Seth. So Jeff, when you do the um, uh, protein purifications, you are probably taking the cell encephalon or the whole brain? 
to what I showed you? Yes. Um, that was dissected frontal cortex, hippocampus, or cerebellum. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so, well, still, if you look, let's say, if you focus on the hippocampus, have you tested if some of those changes are actually regional, region specific? We have not done that. Um, I would suspect there's probably um, diverse effects in a number of the excitatory synapses. I don't think it would be ex like exclusively one subregion of the hippocampus, but that's a good experiment and we would love to know that. I, I, I fall very much in line with um, Seth's description. Most synapses in the brain are excitatory. Um, they're highly diverse and the patterns of changes are gonna be complex and probably region specific, but also overlapping depending on neurotransmitter types and many other factors. Okay, uh, well, I have, I know we are talking about synapses, but I'm very into other cells that are not neurons. So in your mm, proteome data sets, I'm sure you see proteins from other cell types because you have all mixed there. So have you noticed anything, I don't know, yeah. worth mentioning? Yeah, so like, um, so long-lived proteins tend to be present in long-lived cells. This is like a theme that we've learned, right? So oligodendrocytes, for sure, like MOG, MVP, a lot of those proteins that play the structural role. And essentially myelin gets kind of wrapped around the axons as we age. So like there's an inner sheath, which is probably old proteins, and then it further wraps, right? So that's a very strong phenomenon. Um, people have asked us about glia and things, and you know, those are super low abundance cell types, so it's a little bit harder for us to measure those, and we haven't really found anything particularly of interest. One thing I would say is that a, a large number of extracellular proteins in the brain persist for long periods of time. And about 10 years ago, we had a collaboration with Roger Chen, and he had this very intriguing idea about perineuronal nets. Mm -hmm. So these are proteoglycan extracellular mesh that essentially surrounds certain GABAergic cells in the brain. And his idea was that the patterns and the holes of these old proteins may be where axon tracts and memories are stored. And there, we found some evidence for that, but um, it was a long way from actually confirming that those patterns of holes hold the memories. Yeah, the matrix is uh, becoming more and more interesting. There is another question here, which I'm not sure for whom. Are neurotransmitter binding to specific postsynaptic receptors? I'm not sure. I can touch on that briefly. So for yeah. our data, you know, it's we show that this phenomenon with, with the impaired synaptic vesicle machinery, that's ex excitatory, and we could do that based on biochemistry or on imaging. Um, we haven't looked, um, well, other labs, Aaron Schumann and others have actually done similar types of paradigms with enhanced environment where you can actually try to stimulate the the, the circuits based on uh, having toys or running wheels for the mice. And there, there can be some activity dependent changes in terms of transmitter um, release in postsynaptic receptors, but we haven't focused on that much. Can I ask a question to um, Jeff? Um, Jeff, I was really intrigued by this picture you showed of the plaques containing all the presynaptic proteins. Um, I thought that was quite an eye opener and I'm just trying to get my head around that and in that um, maybe naively I haven't thought of the plaques as having really anything to do with the synapses. They're just some sort of aggregation that comes from some part of the nerve cell. Yet it would appear from those pictures that you've shown, if I've understood them correctly, that you've got a, quite a lot of synaptic proteins there and they, they appear to be in sort of almost like little clumps within inside the plaques. Could you just tell us a little bit more about uh, this? Yeah, absolutely. So we think that this phenomena that we're describing is actually like the birthing of the plaque. Mm -hmm. So some several labs at Wash U here in, um, in St. Louis have shown, so APP is endocytosis in an activity dependent manner. So essentially it's on the presynaptic membrane, it gets endocytosis with the synaptic vesicle. And then in that synaptic vesicle cycle, it's running into base and gamma secretase, which is actually producing A beta. And then we've shown A beta is actually associated with the outside of synaptic vesicles. And then that's released in an, in an activity dependent manner, right? And then it accumulates extracellularly, forms oligomers and probably the start of a plaque. And then essentially the presynaptic terminal is essentially like stuck in the cycle where it's releasing A 
a beta re-endocytosing, making more of it and then releasing. And we think, and there's work from other labs suggesting that this may actually be the start of the, the initial phase of plaque formation. Fascinating. I have uh, two questions for Seth. Yeah. Um, one is, did you see any sex differences between your synaptom maps? Not so far, but we're looking at it in more detail now. Okay. And the other one is, okay, so you showed this schematic in which you have a neuron with these little circles that are colors that I assume those are different types of synapses, right? So I suppose is, my question is, you observe diversity within a singular neuron, right? Now, are, is this synaptic diversity influenced by the neuronal cell type? Do you know that? For example, if you focus on layer two, three pyramidal neurons and compare them to the pyramidal neurons in the layer six, are their synapses more similar between layers than within them? Yeah, so the single neuron synaptome architecture is something that uh, we have a project that's uh, kicking off on now. Um, but we do have some, in, and, and, and so asking questions about the different pyramidal cell architecture is really an interesting one and is in fact part of the project. Uh, I could offer you a hypothesis, which is this one, which is that those cells, which are obviously in the same class, broadly speaking, um, might have a kind of a canonical architecture. There might be some conserved elements of that, but there might also be specific elements. And I'll give you an example of how they might come about from knowledge we already have. So what we've already done is to look in CA1 pyramidal cells in considerable detail, um, and we can see gradients that are a function of distance from the cell body to the distal dendrite um, of PSC95 and SAP102. And we then can see a tangential gradient along a sort of a medial to lateral axis, for example. And it's amazing these beautiful subtle gradients that you get. So between neurons of the same class, they won't necessarily have the identical synaptome architecture. And, they, and when you put a whole lot of them together, you'll see that there's a sort of a systematic difference between them, which incidentally, people have described transcriptome gradients along the same level, which again goes back to this notion that this architecture will, of course, in part be determined by the by the transcriptome. Now, with respect to differentiating between, say, pyramidal neurons and, say, granule neurons, there's a very clear distinction if you look on the synaptome maps that we've generated between, for example, the dendritic arbors of the granule cells to those of the pyramidal cells. So there's no doubt that there's cell type differences, but I also want to emphasize even within classes of neurons, there is going to be differences as well. And ultimately, um, that's going to be a very important thing to understand for all these different cell types. And you can imagine there's all sorts of mouse trickery you can get up to to sort of understand that very interesting so much you are only looking at two proteins so <laughs> i cannot imagine when you increase that we are looking at more proteins and i can tell you that when we do combinatorial localization a lot of people started to do this using various methods you start to see more yes more types of synapses yeah makes sense and, it, and I think it poses really a kind of an existential problem for the literature because the vast majority of the literature taking synaptic physiology as an example, taking CA1 synaptic physiology, something that myself in my own lab and with my collaborators, we've used extensively now for decades. And then Jeff was using it in some of his talks. Well, you've got to ask yourself the question, what exactly are you recording there? You tend to, you, when you put on a drug or something, you say something goes up, something goes down, or there's a differential sensitivity, and then you show a PowerPoint slide saying a pathway like this or something. Well, you can look at that completely differently in terms of synapse diversity, because we know those enzymes, and, and the NMDA receptor is not expressed in all synapses in the CA1 region, for example. So when you slosh on an NMDA receptor, you're only affecting a subtype of those, a subset of those synapses. And that completely changes the way you have to think about these problems. And especially when you start to correlate those to behavioral, uh, thing, uh, behavioral changes, which people, of course, have been want to do for a very long time, it really becomes a major confusing issue. So the only way out of the issue is going to be have single synapse resolution electrophysiological and functional studies in parallel to those that are doing the molecular study so that you can classify and know what type of your synapse you're looking at. It's, it's, it will be as important as knowing what cell type 
you're looking at, or is it a B cell or a T cell? You've got to know what the synapse type will be. And another aspect of it is because I've been looking at diversity, well, cell diversity as well, right? And then, I mean, you can many, you can make as many groups as you want, depending on how you know specific you want to be when separating different types. Now the question is, what is the biological meaning? Is this diversity meaning something functionally, or is just diversity? But at the end, the end function is pretty similar. There's, there's no doubt about the importance of uh, that question. Um, in the data-driven approach that we've used in those recent papers, we have just uh, identified 37 subtypes. And of course, the question becomes, are they functionally different or are they all functionally identical? Well, the, the fact that they have these remarkably different um, differential spatial distributions is telling you that it's not a random piece of biology in some sense. That's the first yes. thing. The second thing is that um, we know, as and we've been able to show by computational studies, where we know something about the physiological function of the proteins, and we can model um, functional differences of those. Admittedly, that's not a direct uh, measurement. But much more recently, we have been doing um, other types of studies where we're looking at biochemical changes of a functional kind um, in those different synapses. And we're seeing that we can subclassify those synapses. So these different synapses also, and another point is they, in, in, in studies of mouse models of disease, we're seeing differential effects in disease models on those subtypes. So, um, I think it would be extraordinarily unlikely if these were not functionally different synapses. Every piece of evidence points to the fact that they're functionally different and they also have different spatial distributions and so on. So um, there's a lot more diversity there than people um, uh, are aware of. Mm. OK, so they, there is one last question. I you think this is the last one and we finish. The, it is for Jeff. Do you really think that quantitative approach is best way to identify the proteomics profile? Uh, yes, I, um, I'm huge proponent of isotopes. Um, I have tried um, in vain many of these same experiments uh, using label free um, in my postdoc and it was a lot more difficult to just the run to run variability and especially if you're doing um, highly complex mixtures like brain which is like as Seth is accurately pointing out infinitely complex and um, all types of issues with isoforms and mapping and with the shotgun approach we're doing here yeah we we really like SILAC N15 and TMT based strategies for pretty much all quantitative experiments that we do. Okay good. So I think I need to to give the the microphone to Joe, I believe, right? Thanks, Blanca. Yeah, thank you so much. So yeah, um, thanks very much to both the speakers and for Blanca for uh, chairing a really interesting discussion session. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we will have a form for those requiring certificates of attendance, which is going to be available for just a few minutes after we wrap up. So yeah, thanks uh, to Jeff, to uh, Seth and to Blanca and to the UK DRI for co-organising today's webinar, for everyone who came along and to those committee members who are working away in the background to make this webinar possible. Just to announce that we're hosting our next webinar in the series 